Hello, I'm Jack. And I'm Martin. And we are The The Washboard Washboard Resonators. Resonators. Welcome to our podcast, The The Washboard Washboard Resonators Resonators Present. Present. Conversations from behind the red curtain on vintage music and stories from the entertainment industry. Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Washboard Resonators Present. And this week, we've got somebody who I think is really interesting person. This is um, a, a Scottish-based jazz singer and washboard player. This is somebody who I know has um, l- worked and lived abroad as a singer, has worked all over the world in places like Japan. Um, I think she's a, a remarkable person. And I'm looking forward to finding out about it because I don't really know anything. We've just, um, you know, uh, crossed paths a few times, haven't we, Jack? Yeah, yeah, same. I don't know much about it. I think she, I think she plays a bit of ukulele and stuff as well. So let's say yeah. uh, she could be a Scottish mix of us too. Yeah, there we go. It's just it's horrible, a, horrible mix. A terrible thing, washboard and ukulele. <laughs> but no, she is. Uh, I, I think a remarkable talent, a really remarkable person. And hey, I'm looking forward to listening to the chat and finding out all about her. Here we go. So here we are. We've got Ali with us. Hello, Ali. Hello. And <laughs> you're, 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 you are moving flats today. So thank you for squeezing us in so we could do this. I know you've been moving house, haven't you, and stuff. So uh, thank you for that. So look, when we do these podcasts, we just start at the very, very beginning. So we'd love to know where were you born and in what year were you born? <laughs> oh, oh, you, oh, no. <laughs> you don't have to, uh, you know. Well. Uh, I uh, I was born in Dundee. So it was Dundee, yeah. It was Dundee. So yeah, that's that's where I started out. And um, a lady has to keep her age a secret, We're especially fine. when you get a bit older. So there's no year. <laughs> but I'm still young. Yes. Ish. Um, yeah, Dundee was where it started. Okay. So um, now I hear an accent. So... Um, I'm trying to remember what, what we talked about in that basement of that pub when you, you put a gig on for us. Are you American or part American, part American Scottish? What's what's the deal there? It is the most long-winded and dull story, but basically... Perfect am... for us on the podcast. <laughs> Go for it. Well, I am an, I'm an American citizen and I'm oh. a British citizen. And All right. The way that I became a citizen of the United States, I don't think it would happen today. I think it was a hell of a lot of luck that right. went into it. I was over there temporarily for a few months. Mm-hmm. And then I, well, it's very, it's very convoluted along. I knew somebody who worked at the Scripps Research Institute and I ended up talking to them and they were saying, well, you could probably get a job here. So, so I'm trying to make a, a very long story short. I ended sure. up getting a work visa mm-hmm. and I believe it lasted two years. So, but I kept on being employed. So. I had to keep going every six months before it expired. I had to go down to the home office in downtown San Diego and just queue up all day. Ah, okay. So so so, so the American thing comes probably a bit later then. So perhaps we need to backtrack a bit. So when do you start singing? Well, um, my beginning story is a little different. So um, I I left Scotland, I think just, it was before I was 18. Right. I just, okay. I, or maybe I just turned you to 18. I had full legal capacity to bugger off, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I had been doing art at that point. I'd okay. started the sort of HND program, mm-hmm. having left high school a bit earlier. Um, but in high school, I was singing okay. and playing um, piano. Right. And it was all classical stuff back then. Right. And going back a little further than that, yeah. in primary school, I loved to sing. And I was always the one who was hauled up and put in the front to do the solos, to be the, sort of the, the main, the lead performer of a show. And the only bummer about that was I remember when I would be, if we were singing, uh, you know, multiple harmonies, uh-huh. I would always, they put me beside the sopranos when we were kids. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, because they knew that I would still stay on track and not be dissuaded by 
the sopranos which is what mm -hmm. happens and sometimes i felt lazy and i wouldn't sing and they would always stop and go alison you are not singing because if you were singing we would hear you above everybody else so <laughs> i've always had a very powerful voice um <laughs> Sounds that way. So do you come from a musical family then? Yes, I do. So mm -hmm. um, my everyone in my family are musical. We all play something to probably not the best standard, but it's, you know, we, we, all, we all do. Um, mm -hmm. My little half-sister plays trumpet really well. My other okay. sister plays piano. Mm -hmm. My brother, actually, my brother might not have. I think he just, he was a singer, but mm -hmm. he didn't really do much for that. He was a very sciencey person. My mother played as well. Um, my granny played piano and sang. My uh, uh, grandfather played fiddle. Right. And they were all involved in sort of amateur operatics to some degree or other, including my uncle. Oh, my uncle's also, um, he's a drummer. Right. Yeah. Wow. I mean, this is, so this is, I mean, there, there was no choice by the sound of it with, with that start. And yeah, that I think so. In, in the school yeah. choir or whatever, that sounds like it could only go one way, this, couldn't it, really? Well, kind of. It's kind of a very peculiar and eccentric family. Um, mm. They mostly are doctors in my family of some kind mm. of other. Um, my sister's a policewoman. So it's all very sort of, there's a lot of academia there. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. And I did start out originally doing art and then I went to academia. That's a whole other story. But okay, cool, the glamorous cool, cool. part comes in on my grandfather's side of the family. Mm -hmm. Dame Nellie Melba is my great, great auntie. So what? she's pretty big time opera. I mean, she was yeah. she was the opera singer really back. And of course, this is in sort of bel canto era with um, mm -hmm. just on the tail end of Caruso. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, but that's just that's a tale of the family. But it's pretty cool to be related to her. I mean, yeah, that is. So it's, it's funny because I'm not. <laughs> I've been to three operas and fallen asleep at two of them, and. Um, <laughs> But I've, even I've heard of that name, which is amazing. So um, I'm trying to find a picture of her to show you. because Well, please do. Yeah, but please do. So, so for all the people yeah. listening on the podcast thing and all that, then you can also view these on YouTube and uh, you might see Ali show us a picture shortly. But um, OK, so, I mean, there's all this music. There's all this kind of, it sounds like very creative, very interesting. A lot of sort of like family get togethers, family sing alongs and things like that. Uh, there was, but so back in the day, um, I forgot to mention my half sister's father is an amazing pianist and he was a baritone mm -hmm. singer. So we're going, this is mostly opera stuff that was going yeah, on. Sure. And he used to throw these huge parties um, and all the people who were in town, all the opera singers who were in town, they would be there hanging around the piano. He'd be playing and they'd all be singing and, and I'd sneak out my bedroom and try and be a part and get told, get back to bed, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so, so um, you really wanted to sort of be involved in all that that kind of world then from that from what you know I presume is a very early age. Oh, huge, okay, hugely. Um, oh, we found the picture. There we go. Here's the picture. She's got darker hair. So my hair is not normally my hair is not normally this. Oh color. my can goodness me! Can you see? For, any, for anybody, yeah, I can see that now. Obviously, I'll have to describe our listeners. But what we're looking at is a very glamorous black and white picture. Um, of a lady in a kind of beautiful, what would you call that? Kind of like a, a flowing gown or something. Yeah, well, um, she died in 1932. No, she died oh. in 32. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So it's going. We it's, go. We're going. We're going substantially by. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Okay, so let's let's yes. move through. So before you go to America, which was I think you said before you were 18. So did did you have formal music lessons and things? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I had class, classical training. Uh, so definitely vocally. full training. So, so you, you did your grades and all that kind of stuff? I did. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember how far I got. The, I was playing piano too, and I just couldn't connect to the piano. I just had no love for it. And I, I was terrible because I, I I'm an ear, an ear uh, learner. Right. So they would make me do the sight reading, and I, and I would literally have a panic attack now that I know yeah. what those are. And I, I could play it really, really slowly. So I used to get into trouble a lot. So needless to say, I kind of left the piano behind. Okay. And I, yeah. So you, we, we're going through you. Are you into jazz before you go to America? Or does that happen there? Or does that happen before? Well, um, I, I've always enjoyed it. My mm -hmm. granny would talk about it with me. Right. Okay. Uh, Billy Holiday and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and there's a song and also the song by Mavis Deschen, 
Uh Um, So my granny was fluent in French and German and then she got by in Italian, got by in Polish, you know, she's one of these polyglots. Oh yeah. She would sing Bimmy Bistachen in Yiddish, um, I believe, which is very close to German and in French. And then she'd go, oh, it means this. And, you know, so um, I got a lot of love of jazz from her, but it wasn't until I was in the US well, actually, mind you, saying that, I found my old tape collection and there was a heck of a lot of jazz in there. So, okay. you, you know, your standards, Peggy Lee, um, yeah. uh, you know, Billy, but there was some obscure, the Sophie Tucker was one of the obscure oh, yeah. ones. And I think that came from my granny. Cool. Um, and I've got some old vinyl from back then. And, and again, there's there was a lot of jazz in there. And some okay. Bessie Smith. Now, I got into awesome. Bessie Smith because of the actor... Was it Michael Gambon? Mm-hmm. He, I don't even know. I was very young and he was talking, someone was interviewing him and they said, what were you listening to in the, in the green, green room? I think they maybe just said backstage. And he said, oh, it's probably a lady you've not heard of, Bessie Smith. And at that time I was absorbing um, my stepfather's music collection, my brother's. So I got all these really bizarre tastes. From my brother, I got like Queen and... Um, yeah. And then I tried to please him by trying to like Iron Maiden. I remember that. But it was just to show my brother, oh, you're so cool. Um, my <laughs> sister's father had excellent taste. There was a lot of jazz, a lot of opera in there. And then this, this obscure name from Michael Gambon, who I thought was a pretty cool guy. He came across yeah, yeah. a pretty funny guy. And I um, managed to find a cassette on her. And I thought she was great. At first, I didn't understand. I was like, what is yeah. this? You know, it's very hard to understand. But... I totally started getting into that too. But um, in America, I started, there was quite, in San Diego at the time, there was quite a big rockabilly scene. So, so what took you to San Diego then? Well, well, the reason I decided to go there originally was where my boyfriend was from. Ah, it's one of those jobs. It's one of those, yeah. You, he's, you he's, followed he's, a boy across the I Atlantic. did. He, he's a hippie with... He was a skateboarder guy with uh, long hair. Uh, dreamy. And, oh, yeah. His mother was Dundonian, so, you know, he yeah, was living in... Go. You know, it's, it's kind of a funny story, really. I mean, you, I could have almost, I could have almost get, put that in a sealed envelope. That's Okay, one of those jobs. I wanted to ask, Ali. So, so you were having classical lessons. So we're we having singing lessons as well, or just piano? Oh, yeah, singing. Absolutely. So did you want did you want to pursue a career in music or weren't sure? You said you wanted to do art. So was this before you did? You just thought, oh, well, you know, still still young. Let's go to America for a bit, you know. It was both, to be honest. I loved the singing and I loved the singing lessons. I loved it. But I think I didn't have a huge amount of confidence, which obviously we can all relate to that. And I was getting, I was consistently winning awards for my art, my fine art. Right. Um, what kind What kind of art? I don't know much about art, but well, put it in oh, lamos terms. <laughs> it was basically, it was just, I was doing a lot of portraiture at the time. And that, see, I seem to be quite good at that. Um, it's quite funny because I'm going back into that now as well in a way. But I don't know why. I was probably just too busy enjoying life at the time that I wasn't really thinking so clearly about this could actually be a career yeah mm. you know so so you get to san diego so and, and and you follow your boy and what what are you doing over there then how are you, are you making ends meet are you living in a <laughs> what's happening we're going back into ali the hippie affleck well we we, 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 want, <laughs> what we, want to do, we want to see how this this um, amazing you know jazz singer kind of develops you know the, the blooming of, of of where that comes from so and the experience of who you are so so tell us about san diego and, and... well it's wonderful actually it, you, it makes me go back to a very happy place oh wonderful um, yeah so um i i was living obviously i was living with my boyfriend and his sister right and in a wonderful place called hillcrest in san diego mm-hmm. which was actually the um it's kind of like the Soho um, of San Diego. Right, so right. a large uh, gay population there. So it, you know, it was wonderful. It, great music, great food, just a really mm-hmm. safe place to be. And Beautiful. I was working in a shop. I was just cool. doing anything I could to make ends meet while I was yeah. also, what I discovered at this point was that back in those days, the community colleges, you could go and do a semester of something. And you did. So I was suddenly presented with all these options to try things. 
like mm-hmm. psychology, cultural anthropology, um, different art forms that were separated, different musical things that were separated out. So I just went mad and started doing all these different things to explore, to see what I wanted to do really. And um, I met a wonderful a couple of a couple of sisters who I'm still really close friends with, Lizzie and Felicia, and they're both musicians. So Lizzie, th- this is where this is why America is really cool sometimes. Um, she her mother's from Glasgow, and her father was Cuban. Wow. Yeah. And a heady I, mix. Yeah. And I met her in the dark room of studying photography at <laughs> City College in San Diego. And she heard my accent. She's like, oh my God, you're from Scotland because my mom's from Glasgow and all the, you know. So we, that's how we first became friends. She played banjo, five string banjo, bluegrass. <laughs> yeah, she was amazing at that. She and her cool. sister um, played everything, uh, strings basically. Uh, right, when, yeah. I mean, guitar, band, you know, all these things. So we used to have these great jam sessions. And um, I had, at that time, I was playing something called a psaltery, a bowed right. psaltery. I don't. I don't know what that is. No, I don't know either. Tell t- tell the listeners at home what a bird sultry uh, is. It's an insane instrument. It sounds like a horror show. It's basically, <laughs> you know, you get the plucked sultry. You see them depicted in medieval art. It's like a it looks like, hog nose is the one. It kind of looks like that, and it's got yeah. strings. It's like a harp. Right. You yeah. Play it on your knee, or you would play it like this. So oh, a boat, yeah. right. So that's a sultry, and they were designed to be played along with singing the psalms. So it's a religious instrument. Mm-hmm. And the bowed psaltery found this niche in the really old timey folky community and the Appalachian yeah. community. And it's basically triangular, like a big cheese slice. Yeah. And I had a full one and I can't remember how many strings that was, but I had the, 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 the full size one. Mm-hmm. And you would just sit on a table or you could hold it. And you, it was a, the strings were arranged in such a way that you could put a bow, not, not quite as big as a violin bow, but similar in between the strings so then you would get all the increments so Mm -hmm. and it had all the um you know the sharps the sharps and flats were all there too Mm -hmm. so it was basically i think two octaves of Mm -hmm. just set strings that you would boat up and down between the it's a cool instrument um i have no idea i've seen those so so you're in san diego so did did you take that instrument with you or did you buy it there i bought it there dude you gotta understand so we're talking in the (laughs) 90s here right you could get anything in California, anything. <laughs> to, you know what I mean? Coming well, you, from you, Dundee. It, oh, in yeah. San Diego, I mean, you're on the Mexican border practically, aren't you? So there's probably all kinds of uh, craziness going on. So, oh, what, yeah. Oh, yeah, I bet. So are you performing in some of these, like, the nights, the, the, the bars, the hootenannies, as they call them, the open mic nights? Are you doing any of that? Are you doing Scottish folk stuff or jazz stuff or what? Well, obviously, when I was first there, I was underage. Because you've got to be 21. 21. 21. And you were probably, you said you were pre-18. I was 18 at that point. Right, okay. Yeah. So Goodness gracious. I would hang out with, you know, Felicia and her family. They were all musical. And we would gym, do some jamming. And then I met other people along the way who also played. And we uh-huh. would sometimes be down at the beach, make a bonfire and have a jam session. Inevitably, it was Scottish and Irish stuff. Yeah. And then there was a bit of Neil Young and sort of standard hippie stuff, like, you know, uh, John Baez, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I got to 21, I suddenly there was this whole other dimension, and I met um, my friend had moved into an apartment complex called Vogue Manor. We used to call it Vague Manor because it was full yeah. of some real dopes. But <laughs> a co- it was a very weird coincidence. It was a, I, I basically am friends with a lot of the people to this day that lived in that apartment complex. One of them, yes. Aaron, uh, as ginger as ginger can be, Scottish, hmm. totally through and through. He played uh, he, snare. Right. So he played Scottish music. And his flatmate, no, sorry, the guy who lived opposite him called Ben played the bagpipes. Of course he did. No way. Yes. And wow. we used, they used to go busking in Ocean Beach. And the first time I met them, I was drunk as a skunk. I was like, dancing, right? And they're like, what are you doing? Because well, I'm Scottish. He goes, no, you're not. And I got into this big fight. Yeah, I'm, I'm Scottish and all this stuff. So, and then to find out that they lived in the same complex as my friend of all places in San Diego was crazy. So those guys were really cool. Um, then I met a guy called Joe McCaskill, who I'm still friends with, and he plays in uh, originals and folky type band. Mm-hmm. And we, I started singing in his band. 
And I still remember some of the songs that he used to sing, his originals, they were funny as hell. Where do you go from here then? Like, you know, how long do you live in San Diego for? Because I know you said that you lived in New Orleans for a while as well. So how do we get to that point? What happens in between New Orleans and San Diego? Well, that's kind of the least exciting part, actually, because I wasn't... Really? Yeah, believe it or not. I mean, San Diego is the best part. I mean... uh, What what is it about San Diego, then, that that, that particularly lights you? (laughs) It was more to do with what I was doing at the time. I was just kind of involved. I was meeting all kinds of people and Uh starting out. Everything was really fresh and new, really. And uh, I I sang in the old sods. That was a, mm-hmm. an Irish pub, obviously, hence the name. Cool, so definitely. Um, met various people, sang a lot of Irish stuff mm-hmm. uh, out there. But anyway, I then got into rockabilly. And right, okay, interesting. Yeah, this actually sort of brings me to the beginning of the going back to the jazz thing, really. Of course it does, yeah, because it's so interconnected. Yeah. So what, what, what happens to get into rockabilly? Is it, is it another boy or what happens? No, it was... Um, Going into a place called Tio Leo's in Mission Valley. Um, so I at this point I had actually managed to buy a 1963 Mercedes 220. Cool. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> and but let me wait to hear how little it cost me. Uh, go on. A thousand dollars. Wow. And it was mint because the guy I was dating at this time, oh my god, this is like such a <laughs> He worked for a florist called Stan in La Jolla and Stan and his partner had two cars already. And one day I went to, I went down there to, you know, meet my boyfriend after work. And I saw this car, this gorgeous car, you know, with little tail fins, Uh beautiful. And I was like, wow. And I walked in and goes, wow, that's some car. And Stan's like, do you want to buy it? I was like, oh, I couldn't afford it. It goes, no, it's a pain in the backside. A thousand thousand dollars and I was like okay and um so because he had to keep starting it up and because you know it was an extra car it sat in his garage and it was a family car from the beginning so it was absolutely perfect leather interiors and with the springs so you kind of you're riding along and it kind of bounces um oh man that was some car I will never forget that car I adored it so, so you're driving around San Diego in this this vintage Mercedes yeah. so you, yeah I mean it must have been you must have stood out but you must people lots of people on the scene must have known exactly who you are that's it the, that's, the, the stylish this, this is, Scottish girl yeah this is where the rockabilly thing comes in so mm-hmm. I lived in Ocean Beach at the time and I used to go and wash the car the weekends you know you got a car that good <laughs> you got to look after that thing you know and polish the yeah. chrome and there was two other 220s mercedes owners who lived in san diego one of them was cream colored and one of them was cherry red so mine was dark gray so we would wave at each other when we saw each other you know um and one of them was a rockabilly person and we just had a chitty chat i think it was at a 7-eleven and mentioned teal leo's so teal leo's i went to i thought that sounds interesting they were all dressed up in the 19 well they were kind of mod sort of 60s looking folk and at this point, I was sort of in a 50s phase anyway. I was wearing tons of 50s clothes because you could pick that stuff up for pennies. Yeah, in, yeah. In, over there. Because people weren't doing, you know, this old fashioned thrift store thing and the old tiny clothes. People weren't, they didn't, nobody went to the thrift, thrift stores, you know? Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, that was where the Rockabilly thing started. A band called um, Hot Rod Lincoln were playing. And they were actually produced by Lee Rocker. Remember from Lee Rocker from, from the from the stray, uh, stray cats. Oh, stray cats, right? Yes. Here's the yes. best oh, I, oh, yeah, we got, oh, man, you're taking me right down a bunch of rabbit holes. I love it. Oh. Yeah, so me and my pal loved it. Me and my pal Ooh. Amy, who I still, she lives in Boston. I still know her. Um, so we both really got into that scene and started, I started doing the victory rolls and we used to do all that. I used to drive, pull up in my big 63. Okay, it's a decade later than it ideally would have been, but it's still in pretty class. Parked still up high cool, you know? that. Yeah, by all the choppers and hot rods, it still looked pretty damn good. That, this is um, awesome. Yeah, so that's I was in that scene, and then. Do you do any performing now, or are you just like a member of it? You know. Well, I I wasn't singing it at the time. I did sing. I did start to sing rockabilly stuff. Not that it wasn't it wasn't all the time though, because I was still right. working my tail off and studying. So it was very hard to. What were, you, what were you studying now? 
I was still doing, I believe I was still doing art at that point and arty things and psychology. And I was still um, playing a little bit, but nothing, nothing too hardcore. I was just having a great time. It was California, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that Cal- yeah, being in California at that age with that, that car. Yeah. And it, they say, I mean, that just sounds, yeah, it's like, I think, if, you know, if anybody could spend their, their 20s anywhere, there's probably a few places in the world better, I would imagine. Yeah. And it's not like that anymore. I lived in Ocean Beach. Really? Yeah. Right. And this is where the New Orleans connection comes in, too, because right. my, I lived with a, an Irish guy and I met him because I used to study Arabic. I was studying Arabic at this time. I just thought, right. this is a really cool looking language. I didn't, you know, my grandfather spent a lot of time in the Middle East and I thought that'd be really cool. And they offered a semester. So it's three months. Right. Well, what's, what am I going to lose? So yeah. I met a girl called Karen in my class and she lived with Rudy, who was to become my flatmate when she moved out of state. And he and Paula... After, the, after some time, after I moved out, they moved to New Orleans. So mm-hmm. that's where that bit comes in. That's why I ended up with that. But okay. I also, um, just sticking with the rockabilly thing a little bit longer, I used to work for a company called Surf Dog Records, where I would just do PA rap, running around like a rap stuff. Mm-hmm. And Brian Setzer was on, is their main act on their label. Mm-hmm. And I met him a couple of times, a really nice cat. He used oh, to yeah. perform, and he still performs in Encinitas. I think he still lives. Yeah. I think he still lives in Carlsbad. But oh, does he, he live down there? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He did when I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With his Cadillacs, but he, yeah. um, I used to get keys cut from and all that kind of just running around stuff. Um, but he performs at the Del Mar Fair, and he still does. And that's kind yeah. of one of the big festivals. Also at the Belly Up Tavern. We, we go into your twenties. It sounds like you do. You know, you, you're learning all kinds of interesting stuff. So how do we kind of move on? Like, where what happens as you get into like this New Orleans thing? What what, what when does that happen? Yeah, that was kind of the start of a sort of changing point. I mean, there's so much happened in succession. Yeah, of but course. When I was in New Orleans, it was before, way before Katrina. I think it was about two thousand, two thousand maybe. It's 2005, so I, was, I think, Katrina, wasn't it? Yeah, I was there probably 2000, I think. Yeah. I was going a bit wild at that point as well because my boyfriend when I... Um, I was going to come back to the UK. I right. was going to... This is where things are weird. I was going to go back to Glasgow to retake my higher grade. Right, okay. So you're going to mm. do your... Do you, do, do you call it your school... That, that's super interesting yeah. though because you've just been doing loads of studying it was something did you feel like you didn't achieve something back in no, Scotland it was very calculated so I had at this point I already I now have an art degree I then for some reason I don't know how it happened oh no no I do know how it happened I was doing volunteer work for the feral cat coalition and I was working as a front desk girl at Bay Park Pet Clinic as a veterinary nurse because I'd also been studying aspects of that and it was, <laughs> i know it sounds kind of crazy but see over there yeah, you, you need to have a job that gives you health insurance or you're up you're up, you are, up creek, yeah, right? funny, yeah. so how do you get that a lot of retail jobs don't give you health insurance the jobs that do are places like uh front desk girls uh in clinics mm-hmm. dental systems medical stuff so it made sense for me to be able to go and do that and so i did and I, and I don't know how, but I ended up assisting him with the animals at one point, Dr. Roper, his name was. And he said, you know, if you ever thought about studying veterinary medicine, because I used to ask him questions all the time. And of course my family are all doctors sure. and I do have, you know, I, I did take my sciences as well, not, not to a higher grade level, but I did enjoy sciences too. So he goes, you know, if you ever thought about doing veterinary medicine, I would write you a reference. And I thought, sure. hmm. so what I decided was, and again, this was probably partially me trying to prove something to my dad. I'm, I'm old enough to recognize that now because he's a doctor. My brother's a doctor. You know, my great grand, my grandfather on his side was a psychiatrist. And I thought I could do this too. So I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to study veterinary medicine. So I took courses at Cal State San Marcos, I believe it was, uh, for a pre-veterinary, pre-medical degree. So I then thought, once I decided to do this, I committed myself to it. And then I, uh, the, the music took a back burner. And having spoken to various schools, I discovered that 
the easiest way for me and the quickest way for me to do this was to combine British qualifications with American ones. Otherwise I would have to go and redo a whole, like three years worth of stuff and thought, hell no, I can't afford yeah. that and I can't be bothered. So that therein, back to Scotland, redo my higher grade, the sciences, yeah. then I can then apply, then I can go in with the half and half. And it was an American university in the Caribbean that I applied for <laughs> and was accepted to. Wow. <laughs> my story is you, you, you are probably the most bohemian person we've had on this series so far. This is amazing. Yeah, right. it's, a bit, it's a bit mad, but it was, it's was it been great fun. And I'm delighted I did it because I'm so, I know so much about so many different things now. But Right, so, so, so you, so, so let, right, okay. So <laughs> did, did, did you end up in the Caribbean before New Orleans? No, no, that was after. Right, so you go to New Orleans and are you singing it there or what's happening there? No, a, a little bit, but just sitting right. in occasionally because I was, I, you know, at this point I'm thinking, no, my, my future is in veterinary medicine. medicine. Right, so, yeah. but, but at that time, and I'm, I often try to remember this, when I was there on Frenchman Street, there was the Spotted Cat, mm -hmm. Snug Harbour, mm -hmm. And I think that was about it. It really? was nothing like today. Those That's two interesting. Out. Yeah, those two That's, stick out. You're in New Orleans around around 2000. Yeah. And it's it's not not the New Orleans now in, no. in 2021, which is there's there's a lot of history and culture there. Of course there is, but there's yeah. it's just a place where a lot of, a lot of young Americans go on like spring break and get wasted as well. Yeah, you know, as well as loads of tourists listening to jazz and some 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 good kind of places. So, so 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 for you as somebody who obviously has an interest in jazz and traditional music, did you manage to hear much? Were there any particular bands oh, or yeah. performers you like to follow? Um, I can tell you. Did, did, did I, it have a formative effect on you? Yeah. Oh yeah, because I'd forgotten to mention that I also I before that I went to see the Squirrel Nut Zippers. Right. Yes, I've got some of their CDs in, in the eaves. Yeah. 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 Well, awesome. actually, um, I believe a couple of them live in New Orleans and that I did see them there. Um, I was like, what is this dance people are dancing to? What is, what is, first, what is this music? What is this dancing? And I started to learn Lindy Hop um, yep. and then from there, Babo. So I'd already started to really get into it. I took loads of swing dance lessons, tons, like far too many to be so <laughs> crap at it still. Do you know? <laughs> And, and, and um, that all that all links in with the rockabilly thing to a degree, doesn't it? That you see that a lot. Okay, so th th this all kind of makes sense. And, and then New Orleans is such a seductive kind of place in terms of its ambience, the humidity yeah. and the warmth. I can see why you might fall into the spell of that music. Yeah, and of course, my friend Rudy and Paula are now over there too. Yeah, the, so they'd gone there. So, yeah. so we, we, were you studying in New Orleans then, and were you working as well? No, just it was just working, just grunt work, the usual grunt work yeah. in, in a clothing shop. Um, I don't think any of this stuff even exists anymore. It's yeah. so, it's a completely different place. Um, but the band that I always went to see was the New Orleans Jazz Vipers. Mm -hmm. And they're still around today. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, Lillian Boutte, John Boutte, these guys yeah. are extraordinary. I mean, I adore Lillian Boutte. I mean, she's yeah. absolutely extraordinary. If you've ever met her, I mean, she's very unwell now, unfortunately, <laughs> but... I would, she's the one person I would get tongue tied around. I, I didn't, cause I adore really? tiny wee lady, the nicest, warmest, most generous person. And the way she delivered a song is extraordinary. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, this is, so is, it, is it around this time that the jazz is taking hold to a degree? Oh, you're, yes. going to do, you're, studying, you're studying veterinary, aren't you? I'm about to. Here's the she's next jump to, of the she's story. About, she's about to go back to Glasgow to get a... Yeah. I go back to Glasgow for a year. I redid my high grades, um, did that successfully, got accepted to Grenada. My <laughs> As you do. <laughs> Started studying there. Study, I love the idea that you just you, you have to go to the Caribbean to study veterinary practice. It's amazing. Why not? <laughs> and, so, so tell us about Grenada. What happened Grenada, Grenada was great. I wasn't there terribly long. I was only there for, um, gosh, was it about a year, I think? Uh, Hurricane Ivan came along and that's right. how that ended because Hurricane Ivan came along, wiped out the island, wiped out the school, basically. I'm making a, love, a really incredible story, very short. I ended up going to stay with my friend in Barbados for a while. Were you there when the hurricane hit? Oh yeah, I could talk at length about that. It's a long story. 
the, the, okay. I was there when the, the, the actual eye of the hurricane went over Grenada. Wow. So the whole, and Grenada's teeny, you can actually see it on a map. It's like, you could see Hurricane Ivan, the eye, and Grenada right in the middle. It went right across it. And um, one of the selling points that the university used to have was we are outside of the hurricane belt. In 50 mm. years, we haven't had a hurricane hit. The year I go there mm. is the year it gets hit. It's your um, fault. Yeah, it was my fault. But there's, I mean, that's a huge story in itself, being on the island with no electricity for, you know, oh, it was, it was almost got to Lord of the Flies, but not quite. Wow. Um, so were you enjoying studying to be a vet? No. Did you? No. Right. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very simple, straightforward answer. So um, at what point did you realise then? Was there any kind of internal struggle with, oh, I better see this through because my parents are watching and I've been messing about for a long time and I'm going to do this? Or was there a point where one day just the penny dropped and you're like, I'm not doing it, I'm not, you know, you, you stopped the, the, the plate spinning, you said, I'm going to let it go, forget it. And remember, I've taken out loans to do this as well. Yeah, so you're I'm, massively yeah. in debt. Yeah, at that point, just as 20,000 in debt, maybe. Yeah, well, um, yeah. <laughs> but, Hopefully, um, it, it could have been more if you, you know, if you, it, I'm, sure you got, I'm sure you got a lot of money for your Mercedes, that's great. It would have been yeah. about, I would have been taking out loans probably 200,000 US dollars. It, today, it would be even more than that, but that's what I'd signed up to do. So when the hurricane came along, I was in Barbados staying with my friend and the every, every intention was to go back. Right. But then the school wasn't going to be built. So I was being, I was on deferment. Um, mm. And the school, they were going to try and hold classes back in the U S. So I eventually got sent back to the U S. So I went back to California. Right. At that point, I reconnected with friends. I was doing a bit more music. Um, then I was working at the UCSD. Um, as a sort of in a sci slightly scientific role, sort of lab technician type work, hating cool. that as well. But right. at that point, I met a man who I got engaged to. Ooh, cool, fantastic. Yeah, didn't end up in any wedding, obviously. But <laughs> well, you know, so he exciting, I'm sure. It was at the time for a little while. Um, he didn't want me to go back, and I was like, okay. I'll stay with you. And then it gets oh. exciting again because we moved to Germany. What? <laughs> yeah, we moved to Germany. What's wrong with Scotland, Ali? Well, he got a job in Germany and I was going to run it. You know, I was with him and I started to do a little bit of music there. I started to find it was Heidelberg. There was so little going on. Well, yeah, it's yeah. actually Schriesheim, um, which is just about, it's a, outside of Heidelberg. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to find other musicians and I was trying to, you know, the swing dancing is teeny there. Mm. Um, then things did not work out with him. Um, Have you given up on the veterinary but at this point? Well, I was still, I still was told that if I wanted to go back, I could go back. I could totally okay. jump right back in. But at this point, I thought, I don't know if I want to get a quarter of a mil in debt. Also, you're signing up for several, well, in Britain, it's like several years as well, isn't it? And I thought, Big I like this stuff, but I, I just thought there was just something that wasn't quite right. Mm. It just didn't, didn't fit with you for some reason. For some reason. So then I ended up back over here. All oh, right, okay. So, yeah. so where did you come back to here then in, in Britain? I came to Edinburgh. My okay. thought being, right, if I'm going to be back in Scotland, it has to be Edinburgh. Edinburgh is beautiful. And I thought it's the capital. There'd be more stuff going on. It, it, it's, the, it's the best place. And it, so are we, just, to, just to give some perspective, is this like early, mid 2000s-ish? When, when roughly? I want to say 2006. Okay. Because, yeah, you were, you were I in... Think, um, I, yeah. think, okay. I think. I think so. about 2006, you come back to Edinburgh. Okay. I could be, so, I could be off there, but yeah. So, so what happens when you land in Edinburgh then? Are, are, are you with your fiancé now or not or what? No. no? Okay. Ah, I'm right. too, I like travelling too much for him. Uh, he was Texan, he wanted to settle down and have kids. And, and, and I, as much as I loved him and his family, it was, we were looking at, off two different shores, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he used to get really upset when I performed. Really? Yeah, he didn't like it. Really? Yeah, yeah, he didn't. He, 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 I don't know why, but he. I and when I was swing dancing too, I remember he came and I was singing, and then I in between the songs I danced, and the guy dipped me, mm. and he was like, "You shouldn't. I don't want to see that." And I, what? It, yeah, he, he wasn't. He's 
he's very happy now in his life, but it wasn't, it was, I was a little too wild for him. Mm. That's the bottom line. Ooh. Isn't that interesting? Okay, one, yeah. of the, one, of, one of them jobs. Okay. So um, it's like a yo-yo, you go back to Scotland. And what happens in Scotland then? What, is, is this when the, the, the jazz stuff starts taking off? Or? So um, I was new in town. Now, I've lost touch with a lot of my Scottish friends or I'd been out of touch for quite some time. So I thought, uh, what do I do to make friends? And I thought, okay, <laughs> I go swing dancing and I yeah. find jazz places. And that's yeah. what I did. I found the Edinburgh Swing Dance Associations here and Wiggums had just opened up. So mm. that's where I started. Right. And then I, I was confronted with a whole new problem because <laughs> I liked all the really old, at this point, Yes. I listened to all the old stuff, Bessie Smith, Ma Rainey, you know, Maxine Sullivan, all this stuff. Um, so I go into the jam session and I ask to do, I think, me, myself and I. Yeah. And one person, only the bass player knew it, Owen McDonald. And he knew it because Fazer, his father, was part of the sort of 80, 1980s trad jazz revival scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's an old cat now, obviously. But he, mm. Owen, grew up with this stuff. So with him, I said, right, I, this is what I want to do. I want to do all this really old stuff. Uh, this Bessie Smith, really, really old. And um, that's where it basically started. But I was kind of screwed because I was the only person, only woman, no, the only person under the age of 60 singing this stuff in right. Scotland. There was nobody else. There yeah. were a few a few traddy bands, um, instrumental bands out there. And they mm -hmm. were, all, you know, they're quite old at this point, these guys. And then mm -hmm. Fiona Duncan, of course, she was playing occasionally. She yeah, was yeah. obviously in the Clyde Valley Stompers, you know, um, through the sixties and whatnot. Yeah, um, I've, I've seen her at a place, yeah. Yeah, she's fab, she's, oh, she's a goddess, I love her. Yeah. And then, so then, and then it was just me. So it was really bloody hard. I, I found it very hard to put a band together. Um, Owen was in the band. Um, as Serendipity had it, uh, Tom Davis showed up in Scotland at about this time. And I'd gone to the jazz bar. Bill Kyle, of course, run, run the jazz bar. He didn't have any, um, really any early jazz in there. He just didn't do it. But I'd gone down to the jam session and this young guy was up there playing an absolute amazing guitar. And I thought, well, he's good. And so I, just, I spoke to him at the end and he was brand new in town. And I said, do you like old timey um, stuff? And he's like, yeah, I love it. So we, I started my first band, View Calais, which makes perfect sense to me, but then nobody could pronounce it, View Calais. So I thought, I eventually had to ditch the name, but that's yeah. how I started doing the jazz here. And so what, what 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 was the lineup in that band then? Was it just you and the guitar, or did you, have, no. did you bring other other rhythm sections and front lines in and stuff? Yeah, so it was myself, Tom Davis on guitar, Owen McDonald on bass, mm -hmm. um, Dick Lee. He's a fabulous, an older gentleman on clarinet. He's still one of the, the he's one of the best reeds men in Scotland, absolutely. Excellent. Um, and I still work with him. He's still in um, he's in my band, the Copper Cats, and. Um, Kevin Dorian was on drums, but Ke Kevin's a much more modern player. And I found that as time went on, I started to get unhappy. Oh, yeah, Campbell Norman would join on piano sometimes. But I started to start feel frustrated with the fact that it wasn't the sound I wanted. Do you know, it was, yes. sometimes it was fine, but a lot of times it was an approximation. And I loved all the people I work with, but then I thought, you know, if I want to really do something with this, I need to try and build something from it. And then... I ended up uh, going, this, it's going to sound crazy. I went down to London. I worked for the BBC in London for a while. It was just, yeah. So this was in um, 2013. So 2012. 2012. So what, what, what are you doing at the BBC? What are you working there? I worked in the creative services department. Yeah. Uh -huh. And Fully Street. Right. What made you want to do that? Uh, well, the opportunity popped up. It was an apprenticeship. And I thought, okay. All right. I might as well. If she, I, it's, it's, it's because she'd been sat still for about three years and she couldn't I take know, it it's, it's, yeah. But I just thought, ask her, you know, I want to be in London. One of my friends from Egypt had relocated to London. 
Yeah. So I okay. thought, oh, I'll be cool. I'll go live there but, for I six mean, months to a year, you know? So, so if we talk, so I think, you know, there's something here that I can talk, you know, from personal experience that there was a point, like you said, in the mid 2000s where you didn't really meet many people that were into the old time stuff, but there, there was the trad side of things and then you didn't really meet people. And then I think now what's happened since post the internet and Facebook is these little groups can like swing dancers and tr more traditional music people can sort of find each other. And it's like a little, little cottage industry that supports itself. Yes. It sounds like you really kind of came in early and then going to London is probably a great place to see that and see the best players and meet the best players. It was the best. I would say. Oh, I fell in love even more strongly. And it was when I was there that I decided this is what I'm going to do full time. So it was in London in 2013. So up until, so this is interesting. So 2013, you've been in America in the nineties, whatever it was, but like you, it wasn't until 2013 when it really yeah. struck I, home. Yeah. I, I find that astonishing. I, having seen you and met you, I would have guessed that you'd been doing it for 20 years or something. You've been the jazz singer but it's actually relatively recently actually i think yeah. we all know it jack could say i could say there's a point where just something steely happens deep inside your heart you go i'm doing this and nothing's going to stop me it's this is just everything and it was 2013 in london yeah. for you it sounds like okay yeah that was the the i, I said no more compromising i'm not going to run yeah. myself ragged trying to do you know do things that aren't going to help me um i'm trying to think so 2013 so then i came, came back up and then I actually, I was going down and I was doing a lot of the jam sessions at the jazz bar. Yep. I was performing various places. I, ma I was invited, to, oh, prior to this in 2011 and 2012, I was working for Jazz Scotland as well as a volunteer. So, and I was at that point trying- Jazz Scotland being what? Jazz Scotland being the biggest festival, um, jazz festival, festival provider in Scotland, yeah. So, and it was at that time, I, I was actually given a gig by them. I, and that was, a, that was a part of the big, it was a big turning point for me as well. I started to perform at more and more places. And then I think 2014, I won the, the best jazz focus award in the Scottish Jazz Awards. Oh, nice. Wow. So that, and I was also nominated my album, which was, was this with the same. This was at the same band. I can't remember what you said the name was now. Yo Carré. Yeah, the old, old quarter. It was named after the old quarter in the French, um, French quarter. The old old square oh, is what cool. it means. Cool. Um, so I also self-produced an album with that band. And uh, it was not, it was one of 12 shortlisted for best album of the year. I knew it would never get in because it was up there with like Tommy Smith and all these, you yeah. know, but it may have just been people enjoyed it. So they popped it in and it was what it was. And I was nominated as best newcomer. And I, for some reason, I was also in the best vocalist category. And I won that award. And apparently it was a unanimous decision by nice. the panel. So I was like, right, I really definitely want to keep doing this because it gave me a, a wee bit of... Um, Confidence. Yeah, it did. Ooh. So now, now I find myself really wanting to assemble the best crew, the best to try and get the more authentic vibe. And I think it was around about this time that I found, I approached Colin Steele, the trumpet player. Um, I remember it well because he was playing at Le Monde and I'd gone down there to check it out. And I said, hey, how's it going? I was intimidated because he's Colin Steele. He's huge, huge, amazing <laughs> player. You know, he's such a big star. And I mentioned it to him thinking he'd go yeah whatever and he's like no i'd love that that'd be great send me a message wow. and the rest is history he's like my right hand guy in my bands now you wow. know he's like in all my <laughs> yeah i mean i guess we're sort of in the present moment now um well i, I want to talk about the red hot rhythm makers also like i remember when when we met you in edinburgh that time you you just i didn't know this had happened you, you just dropped in oh yeah i was just in japan playing washboard and and, mm -hmm. and assembly and yeah. i was like whoa and where and the and washboard playing start, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I thought you played a bit of ukulele or something as well, didn't you? Or... Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. crap at it though. <laughs> so is everyone. Yeah. E everybody is. Yeah. <laughs> we just made the same joke. That's embarrassing, Martin. Uh, is it, well, we, uh, oh, we, we, uh, God. I mean... Well, let me see. Yes, that's right. So in 2019, that was a really big year for me. Uh, I went over and I played, uh, I was invited to go play some gigs in Japan. And I connected also with the clap song swing guys, and we did a bunch of gigs together as well. 
And um, where did that come from? Just the internet and finding an internet? Yeah, yeah, we've been chatting and um we have some, I believe we have some mutual friends. And uh, there's a Scottish girl who who lives in Osaka and um two of the girls, well, they live in Osaka. Apart from Ryohe, who lives in Tokyo. No, Kyoto. Mm -hmm. So that's where that came about. And then I was also in Germany as well, working with um, the Rufus Temple Orchestra, who are uh, amazing. They're like my dream dream band, you know? So, so that orchestra, so, so we, 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 you like just brought in as like a, a, a vocalist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did a little washboard when we we went as a, as a trio. I did some washboard on that too. But so, I'm I'm not I, yeah I'm 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 not a relaxed washboard player. I need to well, work. Well, tell us about the washboard because obviously that's you know. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll tell you is, while Jack's one of our novelty there. things that we do. <laughs> um, do I, I, how. How does one get into playing washboard, Ali? Tell us, like, is, is it is it that you really, really, really wanted to do it or that you, just somebody said, hey, why don't you do that? Because we need somebody to fill the sound out. No, I wanted to do it. I really, oh, good, okay. really, really right, wanted to do it. I That's had good. a washboard. I had one in New Orleans. I also, I actually have one at my friend's house in Ohio. Whenever I do gigs there, it's there for me. It's ridiculous, isn't it? You do gigs, you just do gigs in Ohio and you've got a strategic washboard, have you? Yeah, no, for right, reals. Okay. For reals, it's there. Just, just for Jack's sake. So how, how does one, um, you know, learn washboard? Um, did, did you take lessons from drummers? Did you learn? Did you just play them to records? Like, what did you do? Well, I did. I have, I actually have taken some... Well, I started taking classes from Cal McIntyre, who's an amazing drummer. Um, but obviously, COVID, Kibox, all that. Can't yeah. do that right now. But I also took tips wherever I was. When I was in New Orleans, there was a guy called Washboard Chaz out there, and I asked his... Yeah, we, we, we've, we've looked at his videos on YouTube. He's, he's got, like, um, instructional uh, uh, tutorials on YouTube and stuff, yeah. So you, you, really... you met him and played with him, did you? Yeah, and awesome. he goes, yes, I'm so worried about it. He's like, there's no rules, you just play. And it's like, okay, <laughs> cool. And then um, cool. uh, Dizzy from the Shake Shake Em Up band, I mm -hmm. obviously, I'd gone over there and I'd seen those girls play and I, I invited them, well, I said to them in 2017, I was like, look, I'm going to get try and figure out how to get you guys over here. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because the next year, we well, we I got them, booked because I you know through Jazz Scotland and I remember when I met them I picked them up at the train station and I goes did you think I was talking crap and they're like yeah lots of people say because no I make stuff happen girl yeah I'm, I now <laughs> yeah. think you, you, you'd be perfect yeah I mean yeah the amount of offers I've weaved you've I'm sure had just yeah you don't do this yeah sure and it never happens but yeah you actually you'd be perfect for that job in Scotland knowing so many people and like you get hopefully very good players but even just people players from other countries they make festivals exciting and it gives even if they're not necessarily amazing they still bring a different angle to stuff yes like it's, a, it's all there it's always very interesting it's, it's one of the beauties of jazz is that it's this it is this kind of international language where people can get together and make art instantly and it's a beautiful thing it, it really person. yeah it really is and to be honest yes. with you the fact that i it wasn't easy for me because there were so few musicians who were into the music or playing the music because I had to kind of try other people and, and all these different things. I actually, I think it was a good thing because it's given me the courage and confidence to approach people and say, Hey, you want to jam or you want to do something. And, and it also means that I've been very open to helping other people who have, um, good attitudes and they're good at their music and trying to help. It's a nice community. Do you know? It is a nice community. And this is, this is sort of how we met was I, I think, I yes. can't remember how it worked exactly, but I think we basically got an Instagram message off you. I think it was from you and, and from the Red Hot Rhythm Makers originally, but saying, yeah. if you're ever up in Scotland, let's do something. Yes, that's and then, right. And then I was like, we're going to do something. And then when, you know, three months later, me and Jack are booking a tour and I was like, right, I've got somebody in Scotland's asked to do something. And what I, what's interesting when you said about getting stuff done, what you're, you're somebody who stands out a million miles you know we, we deal with so many people in, in normal non-covid times you're somebody if, if you say you're going to do something it just happens instantly and if you say you want something you just do it and it just gets done and it's, it's very rare that it's it's something you do do 
yes. you, you're very good at it and it's fantastic you know so we, we come in as a people who hadn't really played Edinburgh and then we got to do a nice little gig and you sorted it out for us it was brilliant so thank you for that it's it's, just, it's, it's amazing uh humanitarian work thing that you're doing there just to sort of uh, go around the internet contacting weird <laughs> Hairy men playing, playing weird instruments <laughs> and yeah, saying C -c come and play in a basement in a pub and we'll sort it out. <laughs> mm, mm. So thank you for that. But yeah, so okay, so it sounds to me like there's so many things here that are just I think questions, like just general questions about the jazz world. So you were talking about just now about um reaching out to people because there aren't there, there isn't just this this massive amount of people playing the style that you want. So it's taught you that. <laughs> the Red Hot Rhythm Makers, do you still do that band? I mean, I know COVID's kind of destroyed us all, but like what what's do you still do that? Well, um, what happened was two of the girls, one of them moved to Norway and one moved up way up north. Right. And and maybe maybe just, explain who the Red Hot Rhythm Makers are but, first before we see. Yeah, it was basically so I did the my usual thing, which was got in touch with people and saying, look, would you be interested in joining, making a band with me? So I- well, this Because you, I can't remember, what, I don't know what the timeline is, but you weren't hundred percent satisfied with this band you you were playing in, right? So was this you trying to make, you know, gra grabbing the bull by the horns really and starting your own band and leading it and this is what you decided to do? Well, I mean, the bands that I work with, the, the Copper Cats, uh, Bedlam Swing and the Jim Mill Genies. So the Copper Cats are um, tuba. There's a tuba in that band. A six piece band with tuba so that informs the choice of music bedlam swing are a few of the same members but with double bass and guitar so Slightly again amazing. that informs the songs and the third band is the jim mill genies with piano and it can be double bass or it can be um uh, tuba and again that's the more bluesy stuff so basically i, I thought right i i've got such a massive repertoire because i just devour songs that i thought i need to have different bands really to, to suit these different flavors so um bedlam swing of course will have more of a billy holiday vibe probably a bit more classic swing max and sullivan mildred bailey kind of thing and as i mentioned the jim l jeans is a bit more bluesy and a bit rougher a bit of bessie smith a bit filthy and you end up come all that stuff I, I noticed you did the the filthy blues thing the other day yeah I just, you feel I I just released a, a video yesterday on the, the Washboard Resonators YouTube channel, which was uh, the 10 yeah. rudest blue songs or some some nonsense to uh, do a weekly video while we locked down. But um, yeah, thank you. It's, um, so the Red Hot Rhythm Makers was, is an all, you know, is, was an all female sort of trad, would that be fair to say, kind of outfit? Uh, well, mm, no. not really. Wrong. I I know I wouldn't want to call it trad because it kind of became its own thing. Right. So we we started out with sort of some trad songs and we we certainly do like weary blues and things like that. Um, but then we were paying most of most of our attention was being paid to the early blues and early jazz singers and a lot of innuendo, of course, in there because of the empowerment that it gives women. Um, yeah. I mean, again, I'm going to I could talk at length about that, but obviously that's well, for time. It's, it's a question I was going to come to, which is about being oh. a female in, in this world. I would lo love to know about that, but which is, I guess, where I'm go going with this, but we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll contain it by the sound of what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> well, so these girls hadn't, um, obviously Danielle, so I'll be honest, this is what I did. I, I contacted a girl, I'd never met any of them before. Got in touch with them. Are you up for it? Yeah, let's meet up. And then I said, there's also, there's obviously a big lack of good bass players, as there is anywhere. Bass and drums, good ones are hard to find. So I I said to Daniel, look, I'm putting this group of girls together. And I was kind of just between us. I was using Danielle a wee bit as the yard, um, the canary in the gold mine here, because I already worked with her in the Copper Cats. And I thought, if she likes it, then we'll go for it. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the session, you know, I spoke to her, what do you think? She goes, oh, it was great. I love it. So I thought, right, let's cool. go for it. Now, the girls had, were very, the others were very new to this. They hadn't played jazz before and certainly not this type of jazz. So, um, but it, it progressed really well. I mean, it became its own thing. So we started to focus mostly on lots of multiple harmonies. For me, I wanted to vehicle a band where I could try and concentrate a bit more on percussion. So I want, I thought, right, with these girls, I can play the percussion more. I can build my skill without feeling intimidated by 
you know, like the guys that I work with are such outstanding musicians, you know. Yeah, Ross, sure. I mean, Ross, Roy, Colin, and these guys are maestros. There's no question. Yeah. And I gingerly put the washboard on and go. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and, it, and, and you know? no matter what you say, it is a washboard at the end of the day. So it's, you know, it's. Uh, it's a bit hokey, you know. Not necessarily to be taken too seriously. Sorry, Jack. It's there. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's true. So I thought here's a here's a space where we can all go together, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you, and, just, um, you, you get you get to just play and sit in the group a bit and it's it, it sounds almost punky in a kind of way. You put it together, you just like you look like you'll fit good. Let's do it all girls. Let's go out there. Yeah. Sounds, sounds fun. It just sounds like everything you've, you've done in your life so far. It's got the same kind of tale, which you just you just do it and count the count the cost later so like let's just see what happens and it's i think it's a, an amazing attitude i mean w- would you say that you're kind of fearless in that way or is it is it not i i guess i am because i'm just but don't get me wrong i i know the difference between a phenomenal player and a non someone who isn't phenomenal but i do believe that it's important particularly for women to be able to feel in safe to have a go yeah sure. so the right we're going to be having a little get together in july at some point to chat chat about stuff and see what is feasible what isn't yeah because people have moved in different places and um, some of them are getting more involved in different types of work and cool. i'm always someone who wants to be doing as much as i can which mm-hmm. is maybe easier for me than some of the other girls so um but i've i've got um another couple of you know some lovely ladies that I approach as you want to try and do this so I've got these ladies are learning on the job again so to speak uh double bass guitar and uh reads this kind of music so my idea is to try and encourage more women and then we make, make them kind of collective even if it's just for fun yeah it's well, that's, important that's what came across when I when I first got that message off you and I looked down your Instagram and what I kind of got the feeling of was that, it, that the collective is exactly, exactly the right word and now that you're saying that you just wanted to bring women in, even if they don't play, like, right, just learn it and then we'll, we'll do it together. I think that's a really beautiful thing because you play at such a high level with these other people. This is something where it's much more like a grassroots encouragement. Yeah. Like, say, like a fun thing. And that's, yeah. and that's, something, that's something you obviously feel is really important is to give people, ladies, an opportunity, have yeah. a laugh, do something a bit different. So, so why is that? What, what, what is it about? trying to perhaps open doors for, for ladies is it because you've had doors closed in your face or you found it hard at times or in, uh, inappropriate I, behaviors or what it's probably a whole psychology behind it I think because I had to do everything myself basically uh-huh. um which I think was a very good thing yeah. um um but also because in Scotland particularly the early jazz scene isn't res- really given as n- the same amount of respect I think um I'd say that's true in everywhere. It's in everywhere. UK. No, maybe not in London. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you, you, you've lived and worked there. I mean, Jack, Jack, you've gigged there with a lot of the people. Yeah. Like, what, I well, know. I don't know. I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It's my desire to connect with people, um, to meet good people. Um, I don't know. I, but I, Playing music is one of the most beautiful things you can do. For it's sure. so mindful. Yeah, it is. You know, and and I think maybe there's a part of me that thinks it is such a male-dominated art form. Yeah. Mm. And um, you know, Molly from the Shake 'em Up band, she said, you know, we talked quite a lot about this, and when when I was over there, and she was like, you know, it's almost like the women have to be better than the men in order to be taken seriously. Mm. And but I'm also the same way about ageism. Because yep. it's rife. Mm-hmm. And what's wrong with having an old cat playing in the band? I mean, when I was in art, I was in Cork and I believe the sax player was 82. Yeah. And he was great. And he was a, yeah. he, had, he had the best banter out of everybody, I'll tell you what. Mm-hmm. So there's a part of me also that wants to sort of push against that and just say, mm-hmm. this is for everybody. I guess that's it. It's the old hippie in me. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful thing. I think what, what we're seeing there, obviously, when you talk about the underdog, or it's, it's almost like the, the, the veterinary thing again, isn't it? There's this kind of wanting to be of use and help and probably get your hands, to, to literally get your hands dirty to sort of make 
the situation yeah. better for people and for things. So it's there's a definite throughput there. And that, that probably comes from sensitivity and empathy, you, you would think, by the sound of it. I think know? so. I, I and, just... and as mixed with a desire just to move forward and to have a, have a vision, have a dream and make it happen, which is fun. Yeah, hugely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I, I like to, it, I always joke about being kind of Californian and Scottish. So I've got the California confidence and the Scottish Calvinism. So I've got the, <laughs> no, girl, go. Oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Don't you do well, that. And then, you know. I, again, that's that sounds, yeah, almost like sort of a bipolar situation. If you're talking I know. about <laughs> sunshiny California and yeah. Calvinism, you know, it's almost like, yeah. A, yeah, like a kind of... Uh, a dour sense of uh, what can can I can be done. I mean, that's interesting. So I mean, it sounds to me like like the American experience has obviously changed you a lot. Would you agree with that? And yes. Yes. Do, do, do you th- obviously? I mean, your life would be different. But do you think you you would have been jazz singing without going to America, or would you feel like it still would have happened for different reasons? I'm not sure. I, I, I really can't answer that because if I had never gone to California, I wouldn't be anything like the person I am now. So I no. think to be honest with you, the fact that I did that really set the stage for my entire life to just go and do stuff. Yes. And I think I obviously had something in me that made me want to do that to start off with. But second of all, the California attitude and sort of go get it. You can do it that obviously made a difference to me. And I think I carry that definitely still to this day. Mm. But I think um, uh, that gave me the, well, in Cuba, they say the huevos, which is the same thing as the cojones, right? You gotta have the huevos, <laughs> the eggs, right? Yeah. Um, to approach people um, and ask people if they're interested in, you know, maybe doing some gigs and whatnot. Um, and of course that led to me asking Enrico, and you and Bleach, and Joplin, and all these cats. Well, this is something that I was um, thinking about. Like, whenever yeah, things pop up on Facebook, don't they? And um, mm-hmm. I said, oh, she's she done something with Enrico Tommaso or whatever, who is the greatest. I mean, you, you've played with Enrico, haven't you, Jack, I think? Yeah, several times. Yeah, he's like, <gasps> he's the, 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 you know, UK's Louis, really, isn't he? He, in, like, in, my, in my opinion, but. yeah, he, he he does a trumpet thing, which is like a like a Louis Armstrong thing, and he met Louis Armstrong as a kid, didn't he? Yes, he did. Uh, which I think I'd love to talk to him one day. He's a oh, he's, he's, on the, we'll get him in. he's on the list. He's, he's an amazing guy, amazing to see and stuff. But yeah, so I mean, you just I mean, these there's nobody better in the United no. Kingdom, and you've performed with these people. That's why I, I thought you'd be amazing to talk to because I knew there was an America kind of um, thing. I didn't realize just the, the length of it, but there's also this working and singing for your, you know, for a living in this beautiful city and working yeah. with these top, top, top guys, cats. And uh, yeah. it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, to use the parlance, um, it's, it's, I don't know, what an interesting story. I mean, just what you, 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 sh- you, you burn bright, it's clear, isn't it? And it's amazing. And uh, it's been amazing to hear all this stuff. So, um, we well, normally... Let me wrap this up. Can we just say, so can you, what, what's your plans kind of after, after COVID now? What bands have you got going on? Well, um, I just recorded with uh, Rico and Ewan and Joplin and it's a nine piece band. Um, wow. And I took a big risk on this one because I did some really, really old songs, Sophie Tucker, um, wow. a little mixed bag of things there. So that is going to be on the Edinburgh Jazz and Blues Festival on the 17th. I'm just, yeah, there we go. We're going to talk about of July. July. Yeah, Edinburgh, so Edinburgh Jazz Festival, 17th of July, 2021. Yeah. You're going to be there, aren't you? Yeah, well, it's, it's recorded awesome. and it's going to be it's online. Yeah, so people can get, presumably they can get tickets for that. Is that the way it works? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you just have Records. to hop on the website and it'll, it's Ali Affleck. Um, I think it says, well, it's Ali Affleck and the Hot Town Hot Town Tigers is what I've called the band. <laughs> Good name. That's a great name. I had to so, come so, up with something and I thought, Hot Town Tigers. That's so, awesome. So um, we'll, we'll get that out before the 17th of July. And also, what else is there going on with you before we just tie up the end here? Yeah, well, I'm going to be hopping over to back to California since the first time since 2015. So it's, it's wow. going to be quite a sentimental kind of journey for me. Yeah. Um, so Gonna I'm staying take some, a yeah. sentimental Little journey. <laughs> Somebody should write a song about that. <laughs> I, you know, I have been writing original stuff, by the way. It's haven't been out there yet. But I'm going to be over there for a wee while. Um, 
and I've been speaking to a lovely lady, a lady banjo player, okay. and some of the guys from the California Feet Warmers and yep. Jonathan Stout. So we'll see what can happen. We've got to there, see. There's there's nobody better at playing that kind of guitar than Jonathan Stout. I think. Oh yeah, he's 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 fabulous. So I've lo lost a lot of hours on YouTube to watching him. He's amazing. He That's is beautiful. extraordinary. Yes, I, I really adore his playing. So, so you're going over to California, which is amazing. So when's that then? Like here we are uh, in um, 20, sort of late, late July. I'm going to hop over. I, gosh, that sounds so dick. And I'm going to hop over. No, but I, you know, I am internally grateful that I do have an American passport, so I can freely do that. Um, yeah. Part of the thing, I am going to spend more time in the U.S. from now on um, because I think I should really take advantage of that fact. So yeah. Yeah, that's definitely. happening but i'm also i was given a i was luckily enough awarded a grant to do um to put into production a idea that i have for next year's fringe um which is something i'm going to talk to you two about too Edin edinburgh fringe for just in yeah. case uh, as an edinburgh fan you want to talk to us about something well that's that's perfectly brilliant yeah, I think you. I think you would be perfect for this, but um, we'll oh, talk right, about okay, it at okay. another point. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Okay. So, so, to, to, to be continued. Okay, that's fantastic. Yes. Okay. Well, this look. I mean, you really do just like make things happen, and you obviously have this amazing love for it. It's been amazing to hear that story. It's beyond what I expected, and it's a fascinating <laughs> life. And you know what? There's still so much of it as well which is excellent so we what we do at the end we just ask a, a, some simple little silly questions to everybody just to get their reaction so i'll just ask these these little questions and jack okay. a couple a couple as well so uh, the first one is how would you explain your job to a five-year-old uh i get up on a stage and sing songs and act like a silly person there, there we go. Very nice. And I think that's what we would say as well. Yeah, it's, it's something like that, isn't it? Yeah, I, it's a show off professionally. And what, um, how do you have your tea? My tea? How do you take oh, the tea? A little you bit of tea. milk. That's it. Wow, there we go. You know, knowing exactly. what you know now, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, uh, my advice would be to learn more instruments a lot younger. Learn yeah. more instruments. That's interesting. Most people say, you know, take lessons or study one instrument to a higher level, but you're saying more instruments. That's I'm all about the more. I, right now I've got a bloody tenor guitar here, which I hate. Um, but I, you and yeah. you and I advised. You. I hate it. I hate it already. I can't make my fingers do the right shape. So F, you can forget about it. Uh, in a yeah. film of your life, Ali, who would play oh, you? Yes. Oh, I used to say Claire Danes. But, yeah, do you remember her? <laughs> I don't. That shows my age a little bit. Claire Danes, yeah, because she's kind of got that right amount of crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? She's got a slightly that, that, crazy that, eye. No, that, that, that could be a song title. If yeah, or an song, album title. Or yeah, or right? Or a band title. I think I yeah. should go and write that down. Yeah. Okay, so so it, so you're going with Claire Danes, are you? Fantastic. Yeah, I'll go with Claire Danes. Again, yeah. thank you, Ali. And I hope people enjoy this and find your website and see where you're playing back in... Uh, when we get back to gigging more from this yeah. and uh, just thank you so much I, I really enjoyed this it's been an absolute honor thank you so much for this so, thank uh, you so much i do have one more thing yeah, I, I think it'd be Ooh. nice to maybe come back and do i'd like to hear a little bit more about your yeah point of view as, as you know women in jazz and how you feel you're impacting that or other things i think that would be a Let's good do that. wider discussion maybe maybe bring some other people in as well Yes, that's a great idea. In fact, when Danielle is back in town, we should, yeah, let's send let's a message do about that. that. Because on, on these podcast series, we do like to do specialist, take specialist subjects and bring multiple people in. So that would be a fantastic one. So yeah, let's set that up. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Well, look, we'll, we'll say goodbye now. And that's okay. fantastic. I'm going to run and buy some more wine before they oh, cut oh, off. Oh, I'm <laughs> going to pour this All right, my lovelies. I will speak to you soon. Thank we'll you. Thank you very much, Ali. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Jack. So there we go then, Jack. What did you think to that? Yeah, fascinating story. Interesting to know. Yes, yeah, so I as I think we said in the interview, it's it's she's had a different uh, angle to come to this sort of thing than most of the interviews we've had. So it's been yeah, interesting to learn that and and the American angle, the traveling stuff. It's uh, yeah, interesting. I, yeah, I I think I I think she you know like she is a a, a very 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 interesting person that's led a very interesting life and I didn't expect there to be as much as the, there was and I know we didn't really cover 
so much of it, but but there was so much that we talked about. So I found that fascinating, and it's it's you know I I really respected her and appreciated her before as this person that just turned up on the internet asking you know trying to reach out to us to to, to do something for us. So mm-hmm. do you know what I think she's an amazing person, and I think that's that's great that we could sort of talk to her and find out about who she is. That's that's been fascinating. Yeah, as you said, I think it's good to. She's definitely someone that gets stuff done. She wants to uh, mm. have an idea and then try and follow through with it, whether it how long it continues or. It's not, I guess it's not, it's not about money. It's just about doing things, isn't it? So that's good. And I definitely want to get her back to talk about, yeah, women's place in jazz, I guess. So however we frame it, I think that would be a good topic of conversation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we need to set up a, that as a, as a specialist subject for one of the podcasts. Yeah. More, more education, completely. really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, like I've, we, we are lining up some other ones at the moment to do with like resonating guitars and certain blues musicians and bringing world experts from around the world together. So women in jazz would be a fascinating one. I'd love to find out about that and, and what the situation is and try and maybe share that out so it might help people. So that would be good. Yeah, yeah. Good. OK, well, yeah. hey, it's, you know, it's been a long one, but a good one. So let's say goodbye. And thank you for listening to The Washboard Resonators Presents. We'll see you later. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to The Washboard Resonators Present. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate and leave a comment. And to support our band, please sign up to the mailing list. You'll find the link in the show notes and on the website.